This panel is going to cover how we can progress Australian writing to be more truly culturally representative. If we could solve that in half an hour, I think everyone in this room would do cartwheels and, and celebrate, but let's so see what we can pull apart in the 30 minutes that we have. Uh, I would love you, after I, I've introduced these two speakers to us um, in a little more detail, to put your hands together and give them a warm welcome. But to begin with, um, we welcome you, Sunita Perez de Costa. Sunita writes fiction, non-fiction, plays and poetry. And her latest novel, Saudad, about colonial legacies and the Goan diaspora in Portuguese Angola was shortlisted for the 2019 Australian Prime Minister's Literary Awards, the 2020 Adelaide Festival Awards for Literature, and a finalist in Field Notes 2020 Tournament of Books in America. Put your hands together, please, for Sunita. That is some bio, and I assure you that was the short version. And I'm under very firm instruction to keep this short. Uh, Sheila, not found, is a writer, editor, producer and curator working across public health, media and the arts. Sheila writes for a wide range of literary and mainstream publications and was finalist for the 2021 Pascal Prize for Arts Criticism. And as mentioned off the top, Sheila is the code artistic director of this very Addy Road Writers Festival. So please put your hands together, not only for Sheila's work and what she's given the world so far, but also for the gathering that you have curated. It is now over to the two of you. We can't wait for this next 30 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for um, being here for this talk. Actually, lots of familiar faces as well as unfamiliar, which is a good sign because um, I just speak to people who have really heard me talk about this. Um, but it's such a pleasure to be here today with Sunita Perez de Costa, who I admire very much. And her book is Soldade, so um, if you um, are interested in what we talk about today, please seek out a copy um, from Harry Hartog out there. Um, and I guess, yeah, we have a short time, so I guess I'll go right to it and talk about something that since Sunita and I started talking probably last year, I guess a thread of our conversation has been around this whole issue of, you know, diversity. I guess that's the terminology that's used these days. And I guess we want to be provocative about it because in a lot of ways it seems like we're making progress. It, it looks like that. You know, that we're, you know, more um, aware of like different cultural backgrounds, you know, we, we name, you know, we want people from different lived experience to be involved with writing in the arts. But there's also, for me, and as it turns out, Sunita too, we feel there's a bit of, we feel a bit uneasy about this too, because on the surface it looks like we're making progress, but in a lot of ways, I wonder if we're actually going backwards in some ways as well. Um, and I guess I, I reflect on that um, as someone who, when I first started writing, um, you know, in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, I don't think that, you know, I was ever called like a Vietnamese Australian writer. I was just a young writer. And that's, that was very liberating, actually. It really helped me come up. Um, and I wonder what you think, Sunita. As someone who, Sunita had very early success in the, what, what year was it, um, your book Homework came out, which you can talk more about it, as a young writer. And I wonder if you can reflect on how you felt then compared to how you think things have changed now. Thanks, Sheila. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you here at Addy Road. Thank you for inviting me and to Mark, and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, yeah, a really interesting topic. I think very, um, very topical for me because um, I've had a book published um, in the last, my last, it was a novella, not a novel, I should correct that, um, highfalutin um, bio. Um, um, 2018 and prior to that homework my first novel came out many years earlier in a, in a completely different time. I, sometimes I do wonder if 9-11 and the aftermath is the fault line in some of the thinking I have about this and the way in which we are framing certain debates around identity politics for want of a better term. Um, so I do think there has been significant change with that and I mean, the reasons are so complex and they're changing even as we speak. Um, but yeah, I, I, I can say candidly that in 2018, when I published after a very long time, another book, um, a book that is about, I guess in some ways it's about racialization, but it's also about, um, it's about identity itself and whether such, what is identity, what is the self, 
and how racialization and colonialism, in this case it was Portuguese colonial period, um, 1961 to 1974 is the uh, period in which the protagonist Maria Cristina comes of age in Angola. So it's not set in Australia at all, quite different to my first book, also a coming of age novel, which was set in Australia about a God family. The thing, the thread between them, which is something that's a preoccupation of mine, at least in my fiction, is go and identity and I think yes it's interesting to me how I've had to position myself if we move beyond the actual text the work to positioning oneself as a, as a writer in the public sphere if we want to call it that as well because I'm not sure we can strictly call it the public sphere anymore um, it's a really um, it's, it's at times very troubling, yeah, and also um, limiting. And um, I think it's really refreshing to have a conversation like this, even though sometimes we think, oh, do we even want to mention the D word, people like us, again? But to actually say that, um, to, to try and um, engage with the complexity of what's going on and really drill down into why um, these categories might be insufficient for many of us. and um, And, so that there seems to be two sides, and we did a little preparation for this of this coin. And so the one side, of course, is of course, and she was written about it a lot, and I've I've written about it in some non-fiction essays and so on, around um, racial politics in Australia, nation states, how nation states articulate their um, narratives, how that relates to fictions that you create about them. In my case, because I, I write fiction as one of my things, um, I I'm interested in that. But, I mean, I feel like the side we're trying to explore today is around what happens to us when we accept or accept to be categorised as in Vietnamese, Australian, or in my case, really, really troubling uh, thing around Indian, Australian, or Goan Australian even, because of the, the particularities of Goan identity that I've experienced in my own life, where, um, you know, my family are Catholic converts, um, they were, I guess, prof professional elites who came to Australia, but um, the, the conditions now in India around neocolonialism and so on that um, are part of this discourse, um, and caste even is a, an issue that um, I think we don't speak about it very often in Australia, but thankfully it's becoming more talked about even in the United States. Yeah. yeah, and I think what you're talking about is that there's a real flattening, even though we're talking more and more about identity probably more than ever, at the same time there's a real flattening of identity as well. And so then, you know, what you were referring to earlier, right, this thing around Goan Australia, Indian Australian. I mean, those of us, I guess, who are, like, we're both diaspora, we're both born in Australia, and yet, you know, there are obviously, um, you know, certain things about Australia because of the racism and that, that makes it hard for us to be, like, you know, unconditionally accepted, I believe say. Um, but then as a writer though, I mean, maybe I'll get you to read from an essay you wrote where you found yourself in a pretty awkward position um, where as a, a Goan Australian to say that, um, but then you were kind of asked to speak on behalf of, um, you know, a homeland that is, is very distant. Sure, I'll, re I'll read from it. It was a part of an essay and I found it very difficult to write this essay and even finish it where I was sort of reflecting on the aesthetic impl implications as of how you have to perform um, identity as a writer. And this is happening to me because my work sort of transcends boundaries and I do have a relationship that's ongoing with India since I've been a child. And I write about um, the, ba the, the issue of borders, also about linguistic and historical borders. Goa, for those of you who don't know, became... Um, part of India in 1961 through a fairly uh, non-violent takeover by Nehru and I guess in Sardar just to frame why I was sort of interested in uh, Sardar is like a Goan family elites go to Angola in the last days I guess of the Portuguese Empire at the beginning of the um, the uh, war of independence not War of Independence from 1961 was sort of the beginning of that in Angola. So it looks at the complicity of um, of elite Indians, even Brahmins, if you like, in um, in the case of that it was Portuguese West African colonialism. 
I'll, I'll read from this. This is in this part. This actually happened. So it's a non-fiction piece um, uh, called Aftermath, and I'll just read from it. So it's it was they were I was being interviewed, and some, um, a couple of things happened during the COVID period where I was asked to participate in interviews and so on to talk about being a Goan or Indian author or among other things. Um, a few days before news began to break about the extent of India's second COVID-19 wave in April 2021, I was due to give an online interview to some Indian research students about my practice and the topic of Indian diasporic writing. I had asked for questions beforehand, but as they had not come, I thought it might be all right to wing it, to extemporise. On the surface, the students' questions seemed innocuous enough. What is your idea of home? When you write fiction, do you self-identify? But instead of feeling familiar with or confident of the terrain I was on, I felt unsteady, caught off balance. Because of seismic shifts in the landscape of cultural discourse since the beginning of the pandemic, whose fissures and fault lines had no doubt emerged much further back, the questions felt slippery, like they might now trip me up, or worse, unearth something in me that couldn't be tamed or controlled. One of my young interlocutors was in Delhi, the other in Mumbai, and I was giving the interview from my living room in Sydney on Gadigal land. We had already begun when, with further consternation, I realised I had forgotten the acknowledgement of country. Unsettled by this and the fact that the students kept calling me Goan and Indian, I almost started as I answered. Um, I later wondered whether I was uneasy because in promoting my creative work, in particular two books of fiction that placed Goan identity at their heart, I myself had trafficked in these descriptions of myself. Perhaps I had created the Frankensteinian monster of essentialism that I was now coming face to face with. When asked what inherently go and things I do, I wanted to joke in Esperanto that I don't break into song in Konkani. In fact, I am so deracinated that, that I understand very little Konkani, which was not even my mother's tongue. My mother was a migrant, stored over to Bombay from Goa. Nor do I dance Dekni, nor play Gourmet. I do not eat fish curry rice, but I do eat fish curry rice, but I also eat unhulled tahini straight out of the jar, listen to Polonius Monk and Rachmaninoff, and read tank poets in English translation. But I was too tired to be clever or performative, too anxious that my dark humour might be misconstrued amid tyrannical climates of censorship and a clamorous cancel culture. I was also more than just tangentially aware of the spectre of the neo-colonial Indian state that hung not simply as a mere backdrop to the conversation, but as something that touched it directly, complicating underlying global north-south coordinates. For example, since corresponding with the interview organiser and agreeing to participate months earlier, I had uncovered a link between her organisation and BJP Maharashtra that troubled me. I'll go into that a bit more. I might just stop there because it is a half hour. But no, thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think you're yeah in, in that reading, you really outlined some of those a lot of those complexities of you know your own position, um, and I relate to that too in my own um, in my context. Um, and I guess maybe we can go. Um, back to your, your book, because it's a coming-of-age story, um, um, and that's like, and the same with the other one. I think the interesting thing, and I really loved this book, um, and I, I suppose that it's, a, it's set in Angola um, during the time I know very little, I knew very little about that um, coming into this book. But I suppose later talking to you, um, there's an interesting kind of, I guess, an allegory that we can, um, you know, relate it to Australia. So, I mean, we don't think of books like this as being Australian novels because they're not set here, even though it's written by an Australian writer. Um, but I think because of the colonial context, um, and even looking at when I, when I was reading through it, I really thought it was so interesting how um, the Indian family are complicit in, the, uh, in what's going on. Um, and I think that that also explains a lot about what we see in terms of diversity politics too, that, um, and it's hard to not feel complicit in some ways when you then, you know, when I, if I, whenever I hyphenate myself and call myself Vietnamese Australian, I do feel in some ways I'm being a little bit complicit in that as well. Um, so I actually try to really resist um, some of the, you know, because it means accepting, I guess, that sort of, um, I don't know, that the way that I, the designation, I suppose, that you know, people like us are given. Um, but I wanted, like, then just to go back to Sudan, like, Given the context now, you're writing this book in this time. Like, what were your thoughts when you were writing this? Like, where did it come from? 
and you know, obviously you were conscious of the politics of, of today, even though you're writing about a historical period. Thanks, Sheila. Um, I, Sadat um, was published actually many years after it was drafted and um, it did form part of my master's thesis and I um, make some comment at the end and actually my, one of my father's sisters who lived in Lisbon who's just recently died, I feel a lot um, about that at the moment. Uh, she had I'd spent time with her and she'd given me a lot of like documentary evidence of, of things that I did we weave into the, the book. Um, I was living in the United States at the time, so I was doing my master's in the United States in um, upstate New York, or not lower, not lower upstate New York, um, and um, I was really conscious of racial politics in the United States and pretty disgusted by what I saw around me. And this was at the end of the Clinton period, so. Um, do you feel like it was more visible there to you then? As, and also because you were like a, a foreigner, I suppose, like living in the I, US for the masters. I mean, I felt conscious of the... I think I was very already aware of, um, like, I guess, the, the settler colonial reality of Australia, but it had a profound effect on me when I went to live in this other place where there's... I mean, the, the history of, of slavery, Atlantic, the Atlantic slave trade and its impact on the Americas and just the profound, like I just like literally had a colleague who was one of the students who would be afraid to be in his car like at, after seven o'clock at night in a middle class area. Um, this is the area that eventually Hillary Clinton went to, you know, they lived there so that she could get the Senate ticket. Um, and I, it was very, it was very, um, uh, white liberal, uh, the area, I, I found it, um, you know, there's that thing that happens when you go to another place too of, of, of a kind of defamiliarisation that in some ways allows to, you to see something in a more uh, detached fashion perhaps, so you are not, and then I guess underneath I wasn't even conscious that, so I'm literally telling you this was, story was written so far so far before the times we're talking about that I'm promoting it. And um, it's interesting to see, I mean, like at the time I'm promoting it, you know, a year, and when this stuff happens, um, you know, there's the, um, there's so much going on in the US with um, uh, the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. And it feels to me that like these things are an ending, these, things that have happened to us all, and they are to all of us that happen. It doesn't just, hasn't just happened to one, like meaning, we're all part of what has happened. So that's why I do have a concern around this misnomer of diversity, because it sort of, as you say, flattens things out. It almost aestheticizes what is political. And um, Walter Benjamin said, you know, the aestheticization of politics is kind of fascism. So if it's important, all kinds of power and how it manifests gender power, gender violence, gender, the way, way um, colonialism has happened or neocolonialism is happening or questions that have never been resolved around settler colonialism here, that then how we all meet in this is what's interesting to me. And that's kind of what, strangely, that novella is about. It's about the Goan family who go from Goa, and the father's a kind of mimic man, like a Fanonian, or like a kind of, he wants to be, he wants to capitalize a lawyer, he's a labor lawyer, and he ends up being involved in the last days, I guess, of the, um, the Portuguese slave trade, which went on in form, the form of indenturement of black, uh, mainly, f uh, you know, uh, agricultural workers, uh, in Angola until the 60s. In fact, that beginning of the War of Independence was an uprising of um, different uh, sizal and other plantation workers who began that war that ended up being, by which Angola and you know all the, a, a number of other African colonies as well as East Timor, I mean East Timor ended up being taken over by Indonesia as we know. But that was the beginning of the end of the Portuguese Empire, if you like, um, that part, that, that time. Um, and I think, yeah, so obviously as work, you know, because you're a writer as well, the things that I've read your stuff about going to France and this, 
that you're aware of it from your own experience and bodily experience of being a human uh, and your subjecthood in a place like my subjecthood in Australia growing up and I'd already written a novel about some version of that and then this was I guess a way to uncover what would have happened I did have this auntie who went there she was it was not like from the elite or all this kind of stuff around but what would happen if so this father is a is he wants he's engaged in this transactionalism there's a suggestion which if I'd had the I think I didn't have the confidence to write that fully. It's something I'm very interested in around. Um, he's, there's a suggestion that he's involved in the secret police because it was a fascist, Portugal was fascist at this time for a very long period. And um, so for the 60s, it was still fascist under Salazar when the novel's occurring. And, and then of, of course, um, Portugal ended up having a carnation revolution, a peaceful revolution in 1974, which itself was on the back of the wave of the African and other uh, colonies becoming independent. But um, yeah, like this family who are kind of um, uh, not sympathizers, that's, uh, that's but, uh, almost, I mean, apolitical, but he's just self-interested and the family is just there to think, you know, to, to, to be able to get whatever they can from the last days of the empire. And it's, you know, the 1950s and 60s, so, late 50s rather when Maria Kristin is born but she comes of age in this time and I think one thing I was definitely even if unconsciously trying to do was look at how what happens to the coming age story I've already written one but what happens if you graft it on a time and a kind of the filling of the consciousness or the nar narrative world is something where that person um, like, you, it changes what happens to the coming of age, right? If you grafted it on a, a story of um, disintegration or war. Um, yeah, so I think those are some of the things that are in there. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. There's a lot of, um, you know, big ideas in this. Um, I mean, I, and just to say, like, the family, but they're beneficiaries, anyway, of, of what's going on, even if they're maybe not our active collaborators, but, you know, but certainly they are complicit in that sense. Um, oh, the first father, sorry, I should have correct what I said. He's an active collaborator yes. because he's engaged in, in doing the contract, um, create, you know, right, completing the contracts for um, these um, farmers, European farmers largely, who are yeah. plantation owners. Yeah. But, then the, uh, but then the family, I guess, are kind of along for the ride. Um, and then the young... You know, and I guess I wanted to ask you about this because, you know, when I, when I read a book like this, though, it makes me think that these are the kind of books that diaspora writers um, do end up writing because I guess we're trying to imagine our ways back into our family histories. Um, but it's, it's very challenging to do that. I mean, how did you, I mean, you know, because you were born and raised in Australia and obviously a, a huge amount of research and oral history and, you know, papers that went into this, but then how did you actually, yeah, imagine your way into the past like that, into, into this story? Um, yeah, that's such an interesting question and I really, um I really think it's important for us to continue to hold on to the capacity to imagine. I mean, obviously, Maria Christina's story is uh, some elements are taken from something that belongs to me, as it were, but then it's an imagined story. And this thing about imagining selves, but also others, like she then goes on to imagine others, um, like, I think that I felt perhaps more um, comfortable doing it at the time I was doing it than, say, now. And um, I worry that we are creating boundaries for ourselves around the exploration of who not only we might be, but, you know, by association, who what the other is, if we kind of corral what is allowable and so I think that I was definitely uh, f there was freedom I had or I exercised maybe also because I was younger to uh, imagine myself into another culture I, I did have said at different times like when I had to write about it that with the caveat that, uh, that I didn't take anyone else's identity on you know and I'm not doing it in the service of um, exploiting or appropriating an identity um, I think that's very, very problematic. But if we, I think there has to be some imagination 
for us to be able to travel into the space of between ourselves and others. Yeah. But it's interesting that you say that maybe if it was now, you wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable in the same way of embarking on a project like this. It just happens that you actually started this, even though it was only published a couple of years ago, that times have changed in a way that you might have been a bit more tentative then in the form that it's taken. I mean, even someone saying to me, like, after it came out, what, but you never went to Angola, and I was like, that's true. Um, do I have to have gone? I mean, who has the means to necessarily go? And, and there is so much great literature that's been produced, from speaking from the aesthetic point of view, but also the political point of view, that comes from a place of imagining if you get but you have to do your research i mean the reader will find out if you kind of don't i mean especially a reader like you sheila <laughs> um, uh, you know this thing of fine i mean and there are, i do notice there's a lot of rigor now with fiction writing and around that because of this thing around well if you are going into the territory of these interfaces between groups of people you can't be some sort of idiot anthropologist who is either gazing at the other in that way that's objectifying or and not knowing. I think you have to acknowledge and now I, d I don't see why fiction fiction really I think lends itself to being able to like have that nuance nar through narrative like of not knowing like being able to sort of say oh I don't really know this because you focalise it through, say, a limitation of a person's point of view. Um, that's my my thinking now. But yeah, I think it's we're living in. It. I don't know. I. I I'm working on a completely different project, so it's hard for me to say whether that's the reason there's a, a fear or some, or any or any hesitation with say. And it also, it's more complex because it's not like I'm writing about most of what happens, what I'm writing about at the moment in a, no, a novel I'm writing is um, happening in India. So I kind of know the territory a little bit where I'm writing, whereas that I didn't, yeah. Yeah, it was very brave of you. Um, and I think to put it another way, I mean, what you're saying is, um, and I'm going to wrap it up now because we're, um, I think we've reached time, but um, I mean, I think the ethical considerations are really important. And, and I guess I'll, to put it another way, just because we're not white doesn't mean that we're off the hook either, which I think sometimes that's where the, we go backwards with this. That then, you know, sometimes I see things that I think that would never pass muster if that was a white writer, but then sometimes that because people think they want to like, you know, be accused of racism. And so I think, but these are, you know, but as serious writers, you know, trying to grapple with these things in an ethical way and use our imaginations, we also have to contend with the same issues. Um, and I think that's, that's what you've done here. No, and I, I, I really enjoyed it a lot. I felt like I learned a lot about, you know, I mean, because it's, it's distant on my, the Portuguese empire, I know a little bit, I've been to Timor-Leste, but of course I haven't been to Angola either. Um, but I, I think though, I think in terms of the portrayal, your focus was on the, um, a particular family anyway. Um, and I think that, that was, and that's the act of imagination that, you're, that you've described. It's, and it's not necessarily your family history per se, but you know, there's a connection there. So, um, yeah, so thanks so much for um, you know explaining a bit more about the writing process. I found that really interesting, um, and, and thanks everyone for coming today. Yeah, it's very short, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time. So, if you have any questions afterwards, feel free to um, approach um, Sunita, and she'll she'll sign some books at the stall as well. So, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Sheila, and um, thank you all for being here. This is. Um, it's such a joy to behold, to have the conversation that we just did.